Good morning. So good to see you. The scripture says, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. It's a wonderful thing to worship the Lord Jesus, but it's also a wonderful thing to fellowship with fellow believers. Welcome. Glad to have you here today. We were in Kentucky this past week, so we missed out on some things. I know you had a wonderful service Wednesday night. I was glad to hear about that. And um, another thing that happened this week, Amelia Ivey entered the uh, Fat Stock Show in uh, Montgomery and won a first and second prize, I believe. So we're proud of Amelia on that. Congratulations. We want to uh, also remember Cindy Fuller this week. Cindy and her grandson TJ will be going to Israel this week. So Cindy, we, we envy you having been there a few times. I know it'll be a good trip for you. We wish you the best. Wish you safety, but also a good learning experience. I've never been that I didn't learn something different, something better. Last time I went, I learned Israel had no golf courses, and not one golf course in Israel. <laughs> you learn something different every time you go. I hope that you'll be a part of uh, what we're doing on Wednesday evenings. You come and be a part of the good fellowship and service. And I failed to ask, did we decide to have uh, Holy Week services this week? Did we decide? What did we decide? How was it here? Okay, I didn't know. Okay, good. So uh, we'll be planning to have Holy Week services then uh, on uh, the week before Easter. So you'll be hearing more about that as we get other people involved and other ministers involved. We'll be making uh, some announcements about that. Let's bow our heads, please, for our opening prayer. Eternal God, our Heavenly Father, thank you for our brothers and sisters in Christ who uh, share their testimony with others by gathering in Jesus' name to worship, to fellowship, to praise, and to honor you. Thank you, Lord, for this day, this Lord's day, when we can be here and serve you in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to ask uh, Ms. Stars, if she would, please, to bring us our Sunday school report. Good morning. Easter, we've got a lot of work to do, a lot of calling, a lot of inviting. We said, you know, how many we can get here for Easter Sunday? So y'all be working on that for us. Thank you. Good morning, church. It's good to be here this morning and see your smiling faces. If anybody has a new notepad for Miss Doris, it's an Auburn notebook that she uses uh, every Sunday, so she needs a new one. I just noticed that this morning. I wanted to make, make a joke. Uh, I want to read Hebrews 8, 8 through 12 for us, and then we'll sing together. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will establish a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. For they did not continue in my covenant, and so I showed no concern for them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my laws into their minds and write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. They shall not teach each one his neighbor and each one his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest. For I will be merciful toward their iniquities, and I will remember their sins no more. Let's stand together and sing this morning. Hymn number 105, We Will Glorify. Jehovah 
day. We thank you for an opportunity to meet together, to sing songs to you uh, with fellow believers. We thank you for our church family here. We pray you would continue with us the rest of this service, that it would honor and glorify your name. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's continue our singing. Hymn number 348, My Savior's Love. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the privilege Wednesday night in Pauline, Kentucky uh, to attend this church where uh, our family attends, our daughter, her husband, and two children, and our 10-year-old grandson was baptized Wednesday night. So that was a special time for them, a special time for us, and a good celebration for the church also. Let's bow our heads, please, in prayer. Thank you, Lord God, for this day. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. Forget not his benefits. Our Father, we come into thy presence today, praying for those among our fellowship who are in special need of prayer today because of sickness, because of other difficulties they're having in their life. We pray for them. Help us to know how to encourage them and to help them as a body of Christ. We pray also today, our Father, for uh, those who serve you around the world as missionaries. We're grateful for them. We're grateful for their families here in the States and those who care for them. 
Thank you for the opportunity to support them with prayer and our tithes and offerings. We pray, O oh Lord, for our, our world today. We pray for our world at war. We pray for Ukraine. We pray for uh, those people who are refugees. And thank you for the nations like Poland, Romania, and others who are receiving them. Help us thou also, our Father, to have open doors as best we can to those who are having to uh, leave their homes because of war. We pray that the Prince of Peace might rule in that land as well as in our land and in our hearts. Our Father, we ask that you would guide us today as we worship you. May the words of our mouth and the meditations of our heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and redeemer. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together again as we continue to sing of our Savior's wonderful love and matchless grace that he's shown us. Hymn number 344, Grace Greater Than Our Sin. Mercy is more. Sing it with me if you could. Praise the
this day. We thank you for the opportunity and ability to sing this morning, singing together, singing to you. Uh, we pray that you would accept this song of praise as well as our tithes and offering to the furtherance of your glory and your kingdom. We ask you to continue in the worship service that you'd be honored and glorified in all that we do. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. The, the children can go, Miss Cindy. surely be me I thought I could be what I wanted to be I thought I could build on life sinking sand but I can't even walk without 
Brother Cody, and that's a song of testimony. I, I see that in him. He loves this church and the uh, music uh, ministry of this church and does a good job in leading us. And thank you, Belinda, too, for your good work in leading us in worship, music worship. I have some sermon notes. If you folks will pass those out, you're going to do those for me and uh, take care of that. While we, while we were in Kentucky visiting a daughter, son-in-law, and uh, two grandchildren. Two grandchildren are adopted. They're from China, so we always learn from them. But we were reminded of something else this week. We were reminded of why grandparents and grandchildren get along so well. They have a common enemy. Uh, that, that's, that's why that goes on like that. So we didn't. We have to be reminded of that every now and then. So good to see you today. We're in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. Words of Jesus. According to Matthew 5, chapter 1, he didn't just say this one time. He said it over and over and over. He preached this numerous times. And today we're looking at the section where he talks about revenge. I try to plan sermon material a quarter at the time, 13 weeks at the time. And I can assure you 10 weeks ago, I would have never thought that the week that we were looking at revenge and our relationship with our enemies, that we would be having war in our world. So this text today and the text next Sunday on the love for enemies is appropriate in this time of war in our world, I think. Take your Bibles, if you would, please, and turn to uh, Matthew chapter 5, and we'll be looking at verses 38 to 42 on the matter of 
teaching about revenge, verses 38 to 42. Anyone else need notes? Everybody okay with the notes? All right. Thank you, guys, for passing those out for me. Jesus is teaching about revenge. Jesus says, you have heard it said. Now, this is something he's mentioned before as he goes back to the Old Testament. He says, you've heard it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But now I tell you, do not take revenge on someone who does you wrong. Has any, have you ever had a vengeful attitude toward anyone? Has anyone ever come and talked to you about the fact that they have revenge feelings toward others? This can be a very serious matter, a very serious matter. And Jesus lays the groundwork here for us. He says, I tell you, do not take revenge on those who do you wrong. And then he gives us five illustrations. He gives five illustrations in these next three verses. He says, if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, let him slap your left cheek too. Second illustration. And if someone takes you to court to sue you for your shirt, let him have your coat as well. A few years ago, the... Uh, Alabama WMU, Southern Baptist Convention WMU, had a drive where they took up overcoats to send to China. And uh, when we lived in a tougher climate, a cousin of mine had given me a tweed overcoat. Very, very nice tweed overcoat. And since we were living in Florida, I saw no need to keep that tweed overcoat. And I... Uh, put it in the WMU box, and it went to China. And every time I see a group of those Chinese officials on public TV, I'm looking for that tweed overcoat. <laughs> and one of them might have it on. If someone takes you to court to sue you for your shirt, let him have your coat. And if one of the occupation troops forces you to carry his pack, of course, that was the Roman army. They were there. They were in charge. If a Roman soldier... An occupation troop forces you to carry his pack one mile, carry it another mile. When someone asks you for something, give it to him. When someone wants to borrow something, lend it to him. Now, I don't want to backtrack the words of Jesus, but I do. And I believe everything the Bible says. I believe everything the Bible says. My question is, what does it mean? And here's what I think this text means. Jesus used hyperbole to teach us that we're not to take revenge on those who do us wrong. And hyperbole is an exaggerated expression. Jesus uses hyperbole all through the New Testament. And here I think he uses five hyperboles. He uses an exaggeration to show that we're not to strike back at those who do us wrong. The cold hard facts of revenge is that revenge destroys the container. You may spite or hate someone and them not even know about it. I've known of cases of that where somebody just hated somebody else and I knew that other person had no idea that that was the case. But you can spite and hate someone, them not know it, and they'd be eating you alive. And Jesus said, but I tell you, do not take revenge on someone who does you wrong. I do not believe that Jesus was a radical pacifist. Do I believe he was a pacifist? Yes. But not a radical pacifist. A radical pacifist would be someone like Tolstoy who believed that if fleas got on you that you could not take the fleas off because they had the right to their territory too. Albert Schweitzer is one of my spiritual heroes. Albert Schweitzer was a uh, missionary to Africa, a surgeon, medical surgeon. 
missionary to Africa for about 40 years. He was also a trained Bach organist, uh, organist made, his, made the organ that he played on in Africa, one of the most brilliant men to ever live. But Schweitzer was an extreme pacifist. Uh, they said in surgery, the mosquitoes got into the surgery room, he would not permit others to kill the mosquitoes. He said they have a right to life too. And he had a right to philosophy. He said you don't, his, his right to life philosophy was that you can't kill anything, that everything has a right where it lives. Now I believe, this is my interpretation, I believe Jesus was a pacifist, but not a radical pacifist. He was a pacifist in this, we know, because when he went to the cross and he was arrested, he did not return evil for evil. He was spat upon, he was slapped, he was whipped, he was beaten, he was assaulted, he was crucified, and he did not return evil for evil. He was a pacifist, but he was not what I would call again, like Tolstoy and Schweitzer, a radical pacifist. And some of you would remind me that Jesus drove the money changers out of the temple with a whip in anger. He was a pacifist, though. He was protecting the rights of others. Notice your notes there, and let me do a little Bible survey with you here a minute. The cold, hard facts about the creation. God created a perfect atmosphere and fellowship, and we rebel, and our sin brought chaos. God intended for us to have a perfect relationship. God intended for us not to have evil and war and sin. God intended for us to get along with one another perfectly, and in the Garden of Eden, this covenant was broken by sin. The problem was not the apple on the tree. The trouble was pear on the ground. They rebel, and when they rebel, they were cast out of the Garden of Eden. And look at the cold, hard facts also at the time of Abraham. In Genesis 12, chapter in the first verse, God says to Abraham, I want you to leave where you're living right now. Say this was you. Say God came to you and said, I want you to leave where you're living right now. I want you to move to another country. I'm going with you. We're going to start a new nation, a new people. It's going to be a new understanding, a new constitution, a new covenant. What would be our answer? God called Abraham to start a new nation in a new place for a new people. God told Abraham, I'll have a covenant with you. But again, we rebelled. Now, notice the cold, hard facts in the time of Moses, 1400 B.C., time of Exodus. God sent Moses a lawgiver who attempted to resolve tribal revenge. Jesus says, you've heard that it is said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for tooth. That's Moses. Jesus said, I know what Moses said. He said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I tell you, do not take revenge on those who do you wrong. Now, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth seems terrible, but it was not near as terrible as tribal warfare. What was happening is someone would strike somebody else, strike somebody, and he would kill him. And Moses said, no, no, no. We're going to have tribal warfare all through the nation. What we're going to do is going to be eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth. And the individuals won't solve this problem, but the judges will, the courts will. All this went to court. So Moses gave them an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth to avoid more war and to avoid more killing and tribal revenge. Then the cold hard facts in the time of the judges, 1200 B.C. Local military, there, there was not one judge over the whole nation of Israel. There were local military leaders all over the land, uh, like uh, Samson and, and uh, uh, others. God gave local military leaders over the land and they sought order where the people said we desire a king the people were not dissatisfied with the judges they were not satisfied with paradise in the garden of Eden they were not satisfied with the Abrahamic covenant 
Now they're not satisfied with these judges who serve. As a matter of fact, the book of Judges ends by saying this, and every man did what was right in his own eyes. Now how's that going to work? How can you have a nation where everybody does what they want to do in their own eyes? You've got to have some order out of the chaos. But again, Israel refused the judges. The cold hard facts in the time of the monarchy. God desired a theocracy. God said, I will be your king. And what did they say? No, we want a king like everybody else. All the other nations have kings. Why can't we have a king? And the Lord said, you'll regret it. They said, oh, we want a monarchy. And the Lord said, you'll regret it. They said, we want a king like everybody else. We don't need you as our king. We want an earthly king. The prophet Nathan told them that it wouldn't work. And Saul and David and Solomon and others proved that it would not work. God desired to be their leader, and the people demanded an earthly king. Now, cold hard facts in the time of Jesus. In the time of Jesus, Rome ruled. Now, in the New Testament, we read about the Sanhedrin. Now, there were 70 members of the Sanhedrin. What was that? That was a Jewish court. If a matter came up among the Jewish people, they took it to their court, the Sanhedrin. If the Sanhedrin couldn't settle it, it went to the Roman court. And guess who ruled? The Roman court. The uh, Roman 10th legion was stationed in Judea. The most powerful uh, legion of all was the 10th legion in the Roman army. And they were in Judea. And they settled the matter. They settled the matter. And the cold hard facts in the time of Jesus was that Rome ruled. A Roman army was hard-nosed, cruel, well-trained, and organized. And if a Roman soldier says... I've got to go a mile down the road. You take my pack from me. You had no choice. You had to do it. And Jesus said, don't resist that. Be willing to do that and even go further than that. But don't seek revenge. Now, the cold hard facts in the time of today, in the time of Ukraine, what does the Bible say? What, are, what does the news say? What does society say? What are, what are the eyewitness reports? First of all, we will always have the poor with us. And Jesus said that. We will always have the poor among us. Now, have you ever found people asking for money on the street corner? Have you ever had people to ask you for money uh, when you were out shopping or something? And our travel, I noticed even uh, coming I-65, I-65 goes all the way to Bowling Green. Coming back I-65 on every major exchange, uh, we saw people begging for money, food, whatever. Matter of fact, we've taken that trip enough that I recognize some of them at certain exchanges. And I usually tell Jeremy, we, can't, we take fruit or uh, some cookies or something with us when we travel, so we want to stop. And uh, I tell her sometimes, I said, get, get some cookies and, and hand to these people. And we were at an intersection in Lake City, Florida on I-75 one time. I asked her, and I said, get some cookies and hand them. And she gave them to me, and I handed them to this guy. And, and I said, oh, no, not my nutter butters. I didn't mean for her to give me my nutter butters. <laughs> we'll always have the poor. Now, Jesus used the illustration if somebody asks something from you, give it to them. I think it's a hyperbole. There, there are people that will mistreat you. There are people that drain you dry and mistreat you. Just because somebody has a need, their need doesn't create an emergency for you. you. What you have to do, you have to use the common sense, Holy Spirit leadership that God has given you as how to help somebody. And sometimes... Giving them money only contributes, contributes to their delinquency. Have you learned that? Money is not what they need sometimes. Sometimes they need a friend. We were uh, in Bowling Green uh, eating out uh, one day, and there was a lady with a pack uh, sitting down and had some other things around her. And as we were going in to eat at Cracker Barrel, I think it was, 
I told her, I said, if you'll come in, we'll buy you a meal and you can eat with us. And she said, no, I, I, I'm not going to do that. And sometimes you can offer help, but it's not the help that they want. And sometimes you can contribute to their downfall if you're not careful. But we'll always have the poor with us. Some of us were raised poor. Most of us were raised poor. We'll always have the poor with us. But the poor can mistreat you if you're not careful. And secondly, we'll always have war and evil with us also. There will always be wars and rumors of wars. We'll always have evil. Evil is among us today. We'll always have evil. But we need to not be a part of the problem, but be a part of the solution. And being part of the solution is making sure that when we're wronged, that we don't wrong someone else in return. That we be willing to accept a wrong as a Christian. And Jesus did that. Thirdly, a cold hard fact in the time of today is we will always have those who desire to manipulate society. There will always be those who will desire to manipulate society. And in the lifetime of this congregation, you had Hitler, you had Stalin, and other dictators. And to me, one of the worst ones was Pol Pot in Cambodia. Over two million Cambodians were killed at Pol Pot's demand. We've had these kind of dictators in our day and age, and they will always try to manipulate society. I think we'll find that, uh, that we fail if Putin is not tried as a war criminal. Trying to manipulate society, trying to cause grief and sorrow for others. But notice also, fourthly, a cold hard fact about today is we will also always have Jesus. We've got Jesus. How can something be corrected and done? It can be done with the help of Jesus. When somebody does you wrong and you want to strike back, how, how can you resist doing that? You can do it in the name of Jesus. We always have Jesus. People will mistreat you. Neighbors will mistreat you. Family will mistreat you. Society will mistreat you. But we have Jesus. We have Jesus. Do it in the name of Jesus. Do what's right in the name of Jesus. Now some cold hard facts on what we are to do now. In this day and age of war. I believe the Russians are calling it a, a military operation. I don't think the Ukrainians are calling it that. A nation of 43 million people at war. Their millions are trying to get out and go someplace else. A cold hard fact of what to do now. Number one, as believers, we have no personal rights. Go back to what Jesus said. We have no personal rights. Defending personal rights is not what this is about. We have no personal rights. We're to follow the Lordship of Jesus Christ in our life. We live in a time when people are demanding their rights, but very few people are demanding responsibility. And Jesus said we are to live responsibly. We have no personal rights. We're to help those who are in need, but help them in a positive way. We're to help those who need coats and clothing, but to do it in a positive way. And we have no personal rights. Secondly, we are to protect children. Do you remember what happened when Jesus uh, was in a crowd one day and some children tried to come to him? You remember what the disciples did? The disciples were pushing them away. And what did Jesus say? Permit the children to come unto me. It's okay for the, let the children come unto me. It is our responsibility 
to protect the children. Here in this church, in our schools, in our society, in our town, in our land, in our world, protect the children. One of the saddest things in the world, even with the Ukraine situation, is to see all those children being separated from their parents. And we need to do all we can to protect the children. And thirdly, we also need to protect the innocent. Protect the innocent. Uh, when Jesus was arrested, what did Simon Peter do? He drew his sword and cut off the ear of the servant of Malchus, the high priest. Peter swinging the sword. And Jesus said, that's enough of that. That's what he said. That's enough of that. And he healed the ear of that servant who had been struck by Simon Peter. Protect the innocent. Fourthly, pray for the political leaders of the world. God said, I want to have a theocracy. And we said, no, we want a monarchy. And then in 1776, this country rebelled against the monarchy and said, no, we want a representative form of government. In a representative form of government, we elect our leaders. We have the responsibility to pray for our leaders. Romans, the 13th chapter says, pray for your leaders. Pray for the administrative branch. Pray for the executive branch, judicial branch. Pray for our leaders. Pray for the leaders all over the world. Can you imagine what would happen if Putin became a Christian? How radical that would be. Pray for our world leaders. Pray that somehow or another the Holy Spirit can break through to world leaders and make a difference in their life. Pray for all of our world leaders. Pray that the Holy Spirit would move upon their heart and they would receive the moving of the Holy Spirit. And fifthly, resist evil. What can you do in the power of revenge? Resist evil. You don't have to strike back, but resist evil. Seek that which is good and resist evil. Where you work, where you live, resist evil. In Webb, in Houston County, in Alabama, resist evil. No, I won't do that. Resist evil. And sixthly, serve Jesus faithfully. Serve Jesus faithfully. When people wrong us and we have a vengeful attitude, serve Jesus faithfully by not returning wrong for wrong, but good for wrong. I would uh, seldom recommend a movie being made today for a whole congregation to see, but there's one on this subject of retaliation and revenge that I would encourage you to see. As a matter of fact, I, I'd ask for a show of hands. Have, have any of you ever seen the movie Hacksaw Ridge? Hacksaw Ridge? More, more than I thought. A number of you have. If you get an opportunity, watch for that movie, Hacksaw Ridge. As a matter of fact, you can probably check it out and, uh, and rent it and see it. it it's worth seeing. It is, it is a documentary for all intents and purposes. And it's the life of a man by the name of Desmond T. Doss. Desmond T. Doss was a radical pacifist. He was drafted in World War II. He went into the service but would not handle a weapon. He was criticized by his, now this is a documentary. All of this is in the film. They interview him at the end of the film and interview some of the people that lived with him in World War II at the end of the film. They mistreated him his whole company turned against him. Uh, others spoke harshly against him. Commanding officers did things to harm him. The day he was supposed to get mayor, they would not let him leave his post. Uh, the film points all this out. But he never returned evil for evil. 
And finally, they said they would put him out of the military, and he said, no, he didn't want that. He wanted to serve his country. And he got into the medical corps. Desmond T. Doss, Hacksaw Ridge. His company got into Okinawa in Japan at the end of World War II. And he personally saved 75 men, 75 men saved their life by lowering them from a cliff down to a lower area where they could get medical help. And he did it one by one. And he says in that documentary at the end when they interview him, he says, I kept asking and praying, Lord, help, let me help one more person. And he helped 75 in his army unit be saved, their lives be saved. Because he was willing to return good for evil one at a time. Let's bow our heads, please, in prayer. It may be that you're here today and you're dealing with a circumstance that none of us know about. You've been wronged. Somebody has spoken against you. Somebody's worked against you. Somebody's done something to hurt you, hurt your family. Somebody's done something to hurt your business. Somebody's done something to hurt you personally. Maybe today's a day to settle this in God's court. Take it out of your court, no personal rights. Put it in God's court. The Lordship of Jesus Christ. Put it in God's court. Lord, it's in your hands. It's in your hands. Maybe you need to do that today. There's something going on in your life, some past experience. Lingered a long time. It's lingered a long time. Today, put it in God's hands, in God's court. Not claiming any personal rights at all. Not claiming any revenge at all. But saying, Lord, I want to return good for evil. And I put that in your court. Our Father, we, we read your word, we study your word, we try to apply your word. Help us to be people that resist evil and do good in Jesus' name. Our heads still bowed and our eyes closed. Let me ask you something. In a group this size, it's not unusual to have somebody who came to church today knowing they needed to make a public decision that honors Jesus Christ. In a congregation this size, it's not unusual at all for somebody to come saying, you know, today's the day that I need to announce publicly that I follow Christ as my Savior and I want to follow him in baptism having asked him to forgive me of my sins and save me. And I want to make that public decision today. Maybe you came here knowing in advance, you came to this congregation, this service today, knowing that you need a church home in this area. You live here, your work's here, your family's here. You personally need a church home, a place you can worship. Call brothers and sisters your own, your congregation. You need a church home. And you came here knowing that today might be the day for you to make that decision. Is it? Is that what the Holy Spirit wants you to do? We encourage you to be faithful to what the Lord Jesus has you to do. Our Father, as we sing this hymn today, we pray that we'd let your Holy Spirit do his office work in our mind and in our hearts. And we ask this in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Brother Cody, come lead us, please. He leadeth me. Hymn 609.